Shelly Miscavige. She has not appeared in public since 2005. Where's Shelly and what happened? Where is Shelly? We're looking at like 17 years of a person just missing. Shelly Miscavige was given into the sole care of L. Ron Hubbard by her parents when she was 12. This is where Shelly is believed to be being held captive. Do you believe that Shelly Miscavige is a threat today? Oh, absolutely. She's seen it all. She's been by his side the whole time. Welcome back to the channel. This is my next episode of Where is Shelly Miscavige? I'm your host, Claire Headley. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. And my guest for today for part two is none other than Janice Gillum Grady. Hello, Hi, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> We're in for a fun interview here. Yes, indeed. And so you and I had talked, um, after our first part one interview, and I thought it would be good to not only mutually share some pictures that we've collected, but also I, I would love if you could, during the course of going through these pictures, um, talk about what it was like for these children, you being one of them, growing up on the ship and like what it looked like if they were going to try and speak go home at all, all of that kind okay. of feeling of, um, and specifically, again, we'll, we'll cover the question. Like I was curious as we talked about, did Shelly or Clarice ever go home? But, but we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. And of course I will link to your channel. Congratulations on your great success. And thank you for joining me here. And so we'll switch format here and we'll pop in some pictures. Give me a moment here. I just saw them all the way at the end instead of the beginning. So let's see here. All right, so picture number one. So this is um, Shelly on the right and her younger sister Camille. And I included this because um, by my and your mutual study of the family timeline, so to speak, this is actually before or right before they got the family got into Scientology. Right. Roughly. Right. I think, I think Shelly is e probably around three here, um, maybe four, but yeah, she was four when, when, um, Flo and Barney got into Scientology. And then next we have Flo with all three girls. Right, with Clarice, Shelly, Michelle, and Camille. Yeah. And uh, again, think, yeah, go ahead. I think Clarice was maybe, what, four years older than Shelly? Three, four years? She is two years older. So they're all two years apart. Oh, okay, because I thought Clarice was my age. Okay. Uh, well, we can double check and compare notes. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, so for example, um, there's a, a, some specific earlier family instances that I talked to, um, outside family members about when that involved a situation when the girls were six, eight and 10. Okay. Yeah. So that that's at least by my understanding, but you know, Hey, maybe one of these days, Shelly or Clarice can come on and clarify. Exactly. Come out of hiding and tell us. <laughs> yes, exactly. I would, I would love to stand corrected at their hands. <laughs> okay. But either way, so this is a picture of the mom and the three girls. And again, you know, I just, I just look at this and go this kind of for me and, and get, tell me your thoughts portrays um, a life that they could have had. Exactly what they could have had if they had remained as a family unit. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. I mean, you know, I knew Flo when she was in England and she was, she was a fun lady. Yeah. She, yeah. She taught me how to put butter, lemon and sugar on my pancakes. <laughs> nice. Best combination ever. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no, I did an interview with Hannah um, about her interactions with Flo and everyone I've talked to about Flo 
said that she was a real firecracker. So, and so this is a family picture again with a number of different cousins um, and the girls. Yep. And then, of course, I'll let you, you, you can drive on this one better yeah, than this, I can. <laughs> this was us in England. This would have been 1967 when Flo came to America and brought us uh, to America. Flo brought uh, Clarice with her to St. Hill in England, and they actually rented a room from us. So yes. Clarice and I hung out together. We were the same age. And at the bottom of that pile is my sister and my brother. I'm in the middle and Clarice is on top. Yes. And um, and so they were there for, I think you said, like six to eight months. Yeah, something like that. I don't remember exactly how long, but yeah, Flo went to St. Hill every day and studied on course. Clarice stayed home in the house by herself because Peter, Terry and I went to school. Yes. And, and Flo did not put Clarice in school while she was in England. And then yeah, which home. is still crazy to me. And and also, again, to state the obvious, Flo is there with Clarice and her two younger daughters remained in the U.S. Right. They were left at home in Texas with the dad, Bonnie. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. And then moving on here. So now here is Shelly now on the ship. Yes. She must have been about 13 in that picture okay. when she came on board. And I think that's Dee Dee next to her. Hmm. But um, yeah, she was just a little squirt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then there's another one, of yeah, course. Yeah, that's, that's a little while later when she'd been there longer. She was uh, probably a tech page or something at that time running around for the, uh, sec the technical secretary or the the director of processing to get folders and PCs. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what do we have here? Now this here was a wedding and in the very middle of the picture, you can see Shelly uh, on the left. That's Jerry Armstrong. Okay. Uh, doing a toast to the bride and groom, Stu and Joan Moreau. And right next to the bride, you can see Shelly's head poking through. Yep. I see that. Awesome. And and this is the same wedding at a different angle. And it shows that by this time, so this must have been 74 because it shows Shelly in the Commodore's Messenger uniform. And this is what we wore when we were in Europe before we traveled across to the Caribbean. Okay. All right. And this is what we wore in the Caribbean. <laughs> Um, and yeah, you were you and I were talking about this earlier, and Mark and I have talked about this as well. I just can't fathom platform shoes on a ship and the the tight shorts, but I understand. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, and the platform shoes when we got them, I'm like, this is nuts. Having to run up and down stairs in platform shoes, but I mean, we got real good at it. No one sprained an ankle that I know of. But it was ridiculous to be running in platform shoes. And we'd go to the engine room in these whites and these platforms. We'd go to the bridge, we'd, wherever. We'd go down in the hold into Mimeo wearing these stupid shoes. But <laughs> that was the uniform. And <laughs> But that's my uh, sister-in-law, Do, Doreen, on the left and my sister on the right. And you know what? I'm thankful I can find no photos of myself in that uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Is that for real? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm sure if I had 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 have had had to wear that uniform, I wouldn't be finding any pictures either. <laughs> And, and you know what's crazy about it is you're working for the top guy of a religion yeah. and and he's got these sexy little girls, teenagers, because we were all around, you know, 13 to 17 maybe. Yeah. And running on a message to that, the guy isn't thinking of the message run when he sees this sexy little thing coming up, you know, and that can get guys heads spinning. Yeah. And you're supposed to have an ethics presence wearing hot pants. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, 
a really strange dichotomy. Yeah. And even Ken Oka commented on it in an interview I was doing with him because everyone thought, what the hell? Yeah. You know? And it came about with Hubbard telling my sister, who was the messenger in charge, to come up with a uniform, and he pretty much told her what, what it was to be. Huh. And so she then finalized and sent it to him, and then he approved it, and they were tailor-made for us. Wow. So this was dictated by Hubbard, sp yeah. specified. This was not some idea generated It wasn't by... the teenager girls, let's look sexy and wear our hot pants. Wow. <laughs> Oh, boy. And how long did you wear the, these uniforms? <coughs> um, probably about a year. Wow. Because we were in the Caribbean for a year. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. All right. No, no, you're good. You okay? There we go. All right. <coughs> okay. And this picture here is on the left is Trudy. She's getting married to Pat Broker. Okay. And on the right is my sister getting married to Jerry Armstrong. And Hubbard in the middle, he played the position of father. Okay. So this is him entering the dining. Uh, oh, he's just come down the A deck stairs to B deck. He's in the foyer and they're about to go into the dining room where it's all set up with the crew and the whole wedding in there. And Shelly is holding the, the um, veil for my sister. Okay. Now, my sister had asked if our dad could come to the ship to give her away. And Hubbard was actually kind of surprised that she would even ask that hmm. because my dad left the ship in 68 uh, and this wedding was in 74. Wow. And um, so Hubbard had pretty much been the fatherly figure for us you know, since I was 12 years old. Wow. And she was 13. Yeah. So, and, and so, so she had asked for him to come. She had asked for him to come and he was not sealed. He was a mission holder and it was turned down. Okay. All right. And sorry, what was the name of the girl on the? Trudy uh, Venter. Trudy. She married Pat Broker. Okay, so I didn't realize Pat Broker was married before Annie. Pat had been married twice before Annie. Wow. <laughs> he had been, you know, Fran Harris? Yes. She came to the ship as Fran Broker. Wow. Okay, I did and, not and didn't know that came, either. <laughs> well, she came to the ship as, as Fran Broker. They'd gotten married when they were back in Buffalo, when they'd first gotten into Scientology. Okay, so Fran and was his first wife. Fran was his first wife, and she came to the ship. And then in, she came in, must have been 72, 71, 72. And then in 73, when LRH came back from New York, he noticed Fran was shacking up with someone else, and he's like, where's her husband, Pat? And he and he found out that they'd been separated for like so long. He ordered Pat to the ship immediately yeah. to try and save his his marriage. Wow! So Pat shows up, and it was too late to save the marriage. Fran had moved on, so Pat ends up they get Pat ends up coming back to the U.S. to get a divorce from Fran, hanging out in Vegas for six weeks to get residency. Gets his divorce, comes back, and marries Trudy. Wow. Okay. And that actually answers a question that I didn't realize I had about Fran, um, because I, I I obviously knew her as Fran Harris, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I always noticed that David Miscavige treated her preferentially. Let's say, um, not all the time, but. Uh, significantly enough that I always kind of wondered what the backstory was there. Um, and, you know, I, by my observation, anyone that had association with Pat Broker, he, David Miscavige kept significant tabs on those people. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I think for the purpose of control and controlling the rhetoric, the story, all of that kind of thing. 
It's just interesting. Well, Fran, Fran was always a big money maker for books. She had been the commanding officer of the Flag Service Org for a long time when she was yep. married to uh, Frankie Friedman. Yes. Frankie before Friedman. she married Fred. Okay. I didn't know that person. <laughs> well before my time. Okay. Anything else about this picture here? No, well, Shelly's in the back there. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. So then let's go to the next one here. All right. All right. So this is the whole wedding party from the double wedding. And um, I'm, I'm there in the dark blue, second from the left. Okay. And, and on the very right standing up is Clarice, Shelly's older sister. Okay. And then squatting down in the front on the left is Shelly. She okay, yes. Yeah. Yep. And then next to her is Lisa Catano. And then next to her in the purpley blue dress, that's Suzette Hubbard. Okay. And then next to her in the cream is Gail Irwin, Gail Riesdorf at the time. Okay. And was is Lisa Catano related to Kevin and Julie? Yes, she is the sister. Wow. And where is she now? Oh, she, she left a long time ago. She was on the ship, and uh, I don't even really remember her in Clearwater, so she must have left around that time, either towards the end of the ship days, early Clearwater days. Okay. She would have left. Do you think she's still in Scientology? Um, or you don't know? I, I haven't talked to her in years. Okay. I'm yeah. just curious because, of course... Kevin Catano is part of Gold Security, and Julie, as as we've, we, I think we, well, I've talked with Julie, uh, talked about Julie with Mark right. Fisher extensively, um, and of course, Kevin was married for a while to Kirsten Catano of Office of Special Affairs fame. So I was just kind of curious, because right. you start to put together connections and go like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, well... When, when I first left, I called the Catano's dad in San Diego trying to find Mark, yes. Mark Fisher. And <clears throat> I did also find Lisa and I talked to Lisa, but she wouldn't really connect up with me because I was, I was blown and that would damage her relationship with Julie and Kevin. I see. Okay. And I don't even know if she was in touch with them. It's kind of sometimes people are like that. They won't communicate to other friends because it might damage them ever seeing that other relative again, though they don't see him. Right. Yep. Completely. And I, I understand that. I mean, okay, here we go. All right. So in this picture on the right, you can see Pat Broker next to Trudy. Then there's uh, L. Ron Hubbard. And then on the left, and it's hard to see, the first person is Doe, Doreen, my sister-in-law, I'm there in the blackness, and then in the real black is Shelly next to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. And okay. And then we here we have Shelly's yearbook school. pick from Clearwater High School that yeah. she attended until she was 16. Yeah. And you know, those kids, they were treated so poorly at that school. Really? Hold on. Let me yeah. let me pop this out real quick. I I want I would love to There we go. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, they would they were teased for being Scientologists. And I remember like Mark Yeager also went and he would come back so upset because there was these specific kids that would pick on them. Mm. And so one day myself, Biddy, Trudy, and Trudy's sister Bella we all jumped in the car and drove over to the high school in time for the school to get out. And Mark Yeager is coming out, uh, you know, and there's these boys starting to pick on him. Hmm. And so we all jump out of the car and run over and surround him and start hugging him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's 16. <laughs> and we're, we're like 18, 19, you know, we're hugging. Oh, Mark, we've missed you, you know. <laughs> and we walk him back to the car and put him in there and drive him off like a king type of thing. Wow. And they didn't mess with him after that. <laughs> nice. Nice way to uh, handle that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> non-confrontational 
exactly. kill, kill them with kindness kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But those kids had to get up so early every morning to be there at school. And then they'd, they'd come home from school and then they'd have to do homework and then they'd have jobs they had to do, doing little investigations and stuff like that. It, it was hard on them. Yeah. Absolutely. And so let's talk about what it was like for you on the ship, what it would have been like for Shelly, Clarice, like, were there any visits home to visit family during all those years of being somewhere the family didn't even know where you were, right? Your family didn't know where you were half the time. No, no, they didn't. And, And my family knew more than what the Barnett family knew. Okay. You know, because my mom was at running Celebrity Center, and so and she, you know, missionaries would come in, and she would always ask about us kids. Yeah. But Clarice and Shelley, it was it was different. They didn't have a famous mother in Los Angeles. Right. You know, they had a mother that people knew from the St. Hill days, but she wasn't in L.A. all the time. Yeah. And I know Kimma. Douglas, Kimma Dunleavy, she took a real liking to Shelley. Okay. And kind of took Shelley under her wing while she was left as a wild child in in Los Angeles at the at the relay office. Yeah. And uh, so when Shelley came to the ship, Kimma kind of took her under her wing at 13 years old. But we none of us had parents. Well, there were a few, but like myself. My sister, Clarice, Molly, Shelley, Julie and Lisa Catano, Mark Yeager. We didn't have parents. Yeah. And that's when um, Hubbard came out with a thing called Miners Mates, because all Mm -hmm. the miners were to have someone over 21 who was to be their legal guardian. But the Miners Mates, they didn't sit down and say, how are you doing today? Did you go to school? No, we didn't go to school. We, right. you know, we ran down the gangway and took off into town or we hid in the lifeboats, you know? Yeah. So this was more of a legal technicality. Yes. To have the paperwork in place to give you a legal guardian, not an actual, any form of mentorship or right. adult supervision or anything right. of that nature. Well, and some of them did take it seriously, you know, yeah. but some of them didn't. Do you know who Shelley's miners mate was? I think it was Kimma. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, uh, mine was uh, Sandy Wilhair. Oh, wow. Sandy. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Sandy was mine. And um, for a while there, um, Sue, Sue Baker was my miners mate. And then she ended up on mission and then, uh, she, you know, gone. So that's when Sandy took it over. Okay. Interesting. And so, um, so you were obviously working year round. Yeah, we, we worked, um, six hours a day and then we were supposed to go to study and do school at least three hours a day. Okay. And then when we were all told that if we could type 80 minutes on a typewriter, 80 words words a minute on a typewriter, (laughs) we could graduate as soon as we hit 16. So, you know, those last few months of being 16 years old, I was just tapping away on that typewriter to get those 80 words a minute in so that I could just be done with cadet school. Wow. Yeah, and that makes and sense. I know the other, <laughs> others did that too. Yeah. <laughs> but in oh, regards God. to leave of absence, yeah. um, I was on the ship from 68 till 73, so five years. Yeah. Without a leave of absence, because Ever. you don't have money to pay to fly from Lisbon to wherever to get an American visa. Yeah. Like you couldn't get a visa at the embassy where you were. So my sister and I had to fly to Paris or Madrid. And then we had to fly to Los Angeles. That's expensive. Very much so. So and, we were and you're a minor having to pay this yourself. Yeah. On $10 a week. Wow. Which and we also had to pay for our own clothes and we we smoked, so we had to pay for cigarettes. But that was cheap. We got those duty free for twenty five cents a pack. Wow. <laughs> but oh my gosh. Yeah, you had to pretty much pay your own expenses. So ten dollars you cannot save up 
a trip to America on that from Portugal or Morocco. Wow. Yeah. And, so did um, so did any of the messengers get to vi- visit their families at all during that well, time? Finally, my mom came and that's when she said, I'm getting your dad to pay for you kids to come visit us. Okay. So my dad paid. Well, he was a mission holder. He was making some money. I see. But the Barnett's was a different story. Yeah. Now, I do remember Clarice once going on leave with uh, the Riesdorf family. Okay. And she separated from them to go and visit her family for a short period, and then she came back. But I, for the life of me, I cannot remember Shelley going at all. Interesting. Yeah, but I do remember Clarice going once. Okay. But from the ship, but yeah, Clarice but this is been stuck the whole time. Yeah, and so Shelley was late twelve or thirteen ish when she arrived to the ship. Yeah, and. Yeah wouldn't have seen her family until maybe when she went back to California, you think? Because the same way it wouldn't... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because even when we were in Clearwater, her family didn't come to to Clearwater to see her. Yeah. So, yeah, she wouldn't have seen them until we moved to Los Angeles, which wasn't until... um, Well, we moved to California in 77... And we were all mostly up lines at that time over the rainbow. You know, nobody knew where we were. Right. And we wouldn't go to Los Angeles on Liberty or anything like that. So she wouldn't have seen them probably until uh, in the 80s. Unless, oh, when she married Dave, they took a honeymoon, I think. Okay. I don't know if they saw her family at that point. But, you know, you go for long stretches because you just don't have the money. Right. So this would have been, this means that it would have been going on 10 years that Shelley did not even see her mom or her dad from the age of 12 to 13. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to uh, pretty much agree with that. Wow. Because I just can't remember her going on a leave. Yeah. And again, just, you know, those pics, photos that we looked at of her early childhood um, you know, it's just crazy when you go like all the like turning 16, you know, um, graduating high school, no, none of those, none of those milestones were celebrated for Shelly with her family, no. right? No, graduating high school was like, good, it's finally done, you know, here, get on watch. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, Mark said, Mark Fisher said that Mark, Mark Yeager and Shelley did not even graduate high school. They just, once they turned 16, that was, they were out of there. They didn't go anywhere. I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. They were all just waiting until they turned 16 to make the legal requirement. Because I remember when we were at King Arthur's Court in Dunedin, Lois was not yet 16, but she was South African. I see. And she had not gone to school since she was 13 or something like that, too. But And that was in South Africa. So she was very nervous at the thought of going to an American school. I'll bet. So since she was close in age, she asked, can I please not go? Huh. Interesting. And, uh, and Hubbard approved it, that she didn't have to go. But the others all had to go. They were Americans. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, at the time, um, there was much more attention to legalities with with your with the recent arrival to back to Florida and then the eventual move to Clearwater. Is that right? Accurate yeah, to say? We need to have all our legal rudiments in. Yeah. Yes. Legal ducks in a row. <laughs> exactly. We don't want to create any PR problems. Yeah, I know. And it's just crazy, again, to think it. So going to school was not about education or, you know, high school diploma or getting, you know, basic um, fundamentals in place. It was only about legal ducks. The legal in a row. requirement. Yes. Yeah, because when we moved to uh, Daytona and we're at the Neptune Hotel, Um, A classroom was set up with Rich Cohen as the tutor because he had a license as a New York teacher, as a high school teacher. So all those under 16 immediately fell into his class. Hmm. Interesting. 
Okay. All right. Yeah. And any, any, any other thoughts or, um, comments about those years on the ship, like for, for miners, what it was like for you, for Shelly? Well, um, you know, Shelly was a lot younger than us. Yeah. So I'd mentioned before, you know, her being younger. Yeah. Um, she, she liked her sleep. Yeah. And when she'd get woken up in the mornings for like the 6 a.m. watch and she wouldn't show up, yeah. someone would have to go get her. And she was known to throw things. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, leave me alone, you know. <laughs> Which, to be fair, is um, true of most teenagers at that age, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, we'd all bitch about her because she had to do her makeup. And the rest of us, we didn't do makeup. We were like, get up and get on watch, you know, but she always took more care of herself than the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was talking to Mark recently and I, I Shelly told me that, and I have seen it in um, Hubbard's writings too, that he called her Miss Panache. I don't know if that was during the ship days or later when she was at ASI. I don't know if you ever heard that. No, he did, and it might have been when we were at uh, WHQ, went to headquarters in La Quinta. Oh, okay. Because that's when she spent a little more time with him, you know, on the ship. She was she was new, being a messenger, but at La Quinta, she spent a little more time with him. ASI, she wouldn't have seen him. Yeah, right. Yeah, and ASI, so... What, so what came after La Quinta, and how, and how long was the La Quinta time period? La Quinta, was the end of 76 until the end of 78. Okay. And then we moved to Gilman Hot Springs. Yep. But Hubbard was in him at, at an apartment building we called X. Yes. And we would go out there at a week at a time. Oh, so I see. when Shelly would go and watch or myself, we'd go out there and there was messenger bedrooms and we would stay there for a week. Okay. Until our replacements came out and then we'd come back, go back to Gilman. Okay. And what was Hubbard doing during that time? Uh, we would drive into the base to Gilman and do photo shoots. Okay. In the upper res at Gilman. You go climb down a ladder, and we had a whole studio in there because the gym was still being built. Okay. And so he would go in, and uh, he'd have meals at Bonnie View. Right. Before they turn it into this big mansion. It was just a small little house. He yes. didn't care. It was, it was livable. Yeah. And he would go there, have snacks, or have a dinner, or whatever, or take a nap. And then... Uh, JB, John Brousseau, used to drive him and the messengers back to X, drive okay. us back and forth. Okay. And he and Hubbard was staying at X as opposed to Bonnie View for what reason? Uh, security. Okay. In case the well, Gilman Hot Springs property was raided or, or just well, so we, nobody we knew. knew? Because what had happened at, at W, w uh, in La Quinta is two disaffected staff, Adele Hartwell and Ernie Hartwell from Las Vegas, they left, they blew, and they went to reporters and, and basically said, this Hubbard's a crazy man doing these films. He's yelling and screaming, blah, blah, blah. This is his location. And then reporters showed up at La Quinta. So Hubbard took off rapidly. I see. And stayed at a hotel briefly until we closed on Hammett on Gilman Hot Springs. Yeah. And got that out of the bankruptcy court. But he stayed at X until, and that was supposed to just be until we knew everything was secure. Bonnie View was fixed up as a place for him to live. We didn't have, we didn't have any of the fences. Yeah. And that was later put up as part of security in case someone was trying to get to Hubbard. But with Hubbard gone, you didn't need any of that, and you still don't need any of that. It's all no, just this insanity that just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. Yes, no, totally. I know I've talked with Jackson about that, of course, 
Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy, but yes. Yeah. Awesome. All righty. Well, here I will, I'll add back in the pictures and we can run through the rest of those okay. if that works for you. Yes. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, hold on. There we go. Yeah. So that's okay. her high school picture. Yep. Awesome. And this was taken in La Quinta. We, we had several buildings and we had date fields. Oh, Okay. And this is one of the date fields, and the Mustang they're leaning against was my car. Yeah, nice. And, and that's Shelly with David Rousseau. Okay. David was another messenger, and he was married to Claire Popham, Claire Rousseau. Okay. Awesome. All right. And Dave and Shelly's wedding picture. Yes, which we were talking, and as best we can ascertain, this was December 30th, 1981. No, 19, uh, 1980. Okay. 80. Okay. Because one of her bridesmaids blew in April of 81. Okay. So we know that it was before April 81. Okay. And you All said right. it was December, so it would have been December 80. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. So so they weren't dating, quote unquote, for quite as long as I thought they no, were. No, because, you know, um, at the end of 79, I was on leave in Australia at the time. I came back in uh, January 1980. And CMO International, who was watchdog committee, had been moved down to Los Angeles. Yep. From Gilman Hot Springs. And Dave was down in Los Angeles. And he and Shelly, you know, it was kind of a competition at that time between Julie Catano and Shelly. Dave was kind of the only eligible bachelor, you know, the young around their age. So yep. they were kind of competing against each other. But I remember through that first part of 1980, while we we're in LA, every Libs, Dave was either, either driving up to Gilman or Shelly was catching a ride down. But it was usually mm. Dave and Jaeger driving up to Gilman because Jaeger was dating Michelle and Dave was dating Shelly. Interesting. And I'm not sure if you knew about this, but I saw someone comment that... Um, in this time period, Shelley was actually debating between marrying Dave or some other person. Yeah, I think that was um, Tom Francis. I got a picture of him. He was a cutie. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And again, history could have been very different, I guess. Yeah, it, it could have been very different. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. and were you at this at Dave and Shelley's wedding or no? You know, for the life of me, I cannot remember it. Okay. So I'm like, where was I? I can't even figure out where I was. And okay. Paul's not here to help me. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I know, but yeah, because the month before, November 30th, I got married. Okay. No, November 29th, I got married, and Dave was actually my photographer. Interesting. He and Mark Yeager and Mark Inber were the photographers for Paul's in my wedding. Okay. But I can't remember why I wasn't at theirs, or maybe I was, and I just don't remember it. Okay. Fair enough. Um, here we go. Yeah, so this is Norman Starkey is the minister. Oh, my gosh. I did not recognize that that was Norman, and I didn't yeah. know that he, he married them either. Yeah. Wow. Well, he used to do all the, uh, he did a lot of the weddings on the ship. Okay. And he got, you know, he's certified as a minister. Yep. And normally what we do when you get married is you go to Riverside County, you do the blood test, you register, you get a marriage certificate there, a blank one, because I got a blank one. And when I got married, I just had it filled in and then had Heber sign it because Heber was my minister. Huh. And that's what they probably would have done. Okay. And then from the left, that's John Nelson, the tall one. Yep. And then there's Dave with Shelley next to him. And then Gail 
Irwin, okay. Doe, my sister-in-law, and then Clarice. Okay. All and Clarice, right. people will know her as CB. Yes, exactly. That's how I knew her. Yeah, for the longest time when I arrived at the base in September 1991, I didn't even realize Clarice was Shelley's sister. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. All right, here we go. Here's a different picture. Yep, so there's Shelly in the middle in the front. Yep. Doreen laughing on the left. Yep. Gail behind her, and then Clarice on the right. Interesting. And so of this, of these, the only two remaining in the C organization, of course, is Shelly and Clarice. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And, and the reason, Doreen, the one on the left, she's the one that blew in April 81. That's why I know this wedding was before then. Okay. Because Doreen was the commanding officer of the CMO SU, which was special unit at the base. Right, which, which is then what Shelly... Yes, and so Shelly took over from her? Shelly was her deputy, and then when Doreen blew, Shelly got it by default. Ah, okay, I see. All righty then. Okay, and what have we here? Here is Marion and Bill Dendu's wedding, Marion Powell. Yep. Or Marion Dendu. Yes. Um, yeah, so that's their wedding, and... Next to Marion on the right is my sister as the maid of honor. Okay. And I can't, I didn't really look at who the middle one was, but that's Shelly on the right. Okay. And her arm is down holding Taryn Rinder, Mike Rinder's daughter. Wow. That's crazy. And do you know what year this one was? Oh, it would have been... 87 88 okay so well after this was so this was well after shelly was married but miscavige is not david is not in this no 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 yeah interesting. But yeah this is well after um you know they'd been at asi and down down there and it's just crazy look at taryn oh my goodness yeah yeah okay and then then we have more recent pictures of shelly and yep. there we go yeah and i like that one that's such a great photo of her yeah yeah this is very much how i remember her during um the years i worked with her at religious technology center so here let me do this here uh, boom all right <laughs> Well, thank you so much for going through all of those with me. Um, I, I'm curious if you have any other thoughts since all the materials have come out with the from Yashar Ali about the LAPD investigation. Yeah, you know, I don't know what I don't know all the details on what the police are doing and so forth. But you know, I've been thinking about it. And I know some people had a problem with me saying, oh, she, you know, she might be happy, but you got to realize I, I've been in her situation where I was locked up for 11 days because I wanted to leave. Yes. And it was a letter from Mary Sue that convinced me to stay. Hmm. And though I wasn't happy about it, I had nowhere else to go. Yes. And... So I, I can see where Shelly would be at, where you've got nowhere else to go. So you end up mentally switching things around to accept your condition. Right. And then you have to, within that frame, you find a happiness somewhere. Right. Because you know, even while I was in the RPF, I didn't want to be there, but I had no other solution. So instead of being miserable about, miserable about it, I would find joking around and doing fun things and, you know, would help me raise above that position of being miserable. Yeah. You're, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. It's kind of the tenacity of human nature. You find a, a will and a way to survive. Exactly. And, and there's a lot of relativity involved too, like going through the family history Shelly has been alienated from, she certainly has had no 
close relationship with any family member since before she was arrived on the ship at the age of 12, right? Exactly. And, and I, I've been there. Yeah. Where you disconnect from your parents. They might be your parents, but they're not terminals for you. Right. And they're just kind of, they're over there. They're not part of your life. Yeah. There's and not that's the... the same thing that she would be going through. It's yeah. not part of her life. Yeah. The family bonds have long been eroded. Is that fair exactly. to say? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All righty. Yep. And, and I, I, of course, under, understood um, what you were saying. And, and again, I'm not, uh, you know, this is not a scripted <laughs> series. I'm just like, I'm just uh, fascinated on the adventure. I've come along learning so much about Shelly. And I so appreciate you and Mark and everyone who's taken time to share this with me because, you know, again, Shelly's a yeah. real person. And um, and hopefully one day she can tell uh, tell us herself that she's okay and either yes. that she's happy where she is or that she's not and she would exactly. like exactly and if she's not happy I will go get her yeah I will too you know? <laughs> I will go get her yes but what? if she's happy it's like fine yeah but I know we used to joke oh let's just take a bus and drive up there and tell anyone hey come aboard you know we'll help you get sit up outside. But a lot of them won't do it. Yeah. They think, yeah. They, they think they are helping clear the planet and doing a good job about it. Yeah. And. No, if, you're, you're absolutely right. To me, the very first step in unraveling this disaster is for them, for any one of those people in that situation or any, in any similar situation to what Shelley is in, to have an open and unfiltered um, line to somebody in the outside world that they love or respect or trust or to right. at least can at least work to establish those elements to then start, you know, well, what right. do you want to do? Um, you know, and in, in many cases too, there's been severe erosion and actually direct sabotage of of trust to outside people or outside family you know like obviously um like in in my case for example my family believes i'm a bad person and you know on and on and on and unless i can talk to them directly right to walk that back uh there's no hope in hell that <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there isn't. Yeah. And, and, you know, my brother in 73, my brother had Mary Sue's permission to leave the Sea Org okay. and go and train to do the Olympics because that's what he'd always wanted to do was swim in the Olympics. Wow. So he goes on a leave, leaves his wife on the ship, goes on a leave, stays with my dad, is training for the Olympics. My mom's telling him he's off purpose. Wow. Well, he's off her purpose, but he's trying to do his purpose. Right. But because he was an American, he couldn't swim on the U.S. team. So then he'd have to go back to Australia, which he had no money to do. He had no family there. So where's he, how is he going to swim on the Australian team? So And then mom's saying, you're off purpose. So he goes back to the ship. Wow. You know, so you don't have anywhere to go. And I know also times when I had wanted to leave, I'm like, where would I go? Yeah. Oh, there's all these people I know out there, but they're SPs. Right. And if I, as a good Scientologist, even said hello to one of those SPs, oh my God, I could be in ethics trouble. Yeah. So even when you want to leave, you think you're going to ruin your eternity by asking an SP like you or me for help. Yeah. So let, let's throw out a dare to anyone listening, and this applies to you. Give us a call, and if you don't like what we have to say, we will never talk about it ever again. And again, the Aftermath Foundation is it, it exists now. And to reiterate, um, because we've talked about this before, but yeah. there is no requirement for, like in other words, anyone the Aftermath Foundation helps they 
can either tell their story or not. There's no mandate I, that you have to share your story because as you and I both know, the a person has to be ready, willing, and on their terms, able to share their story. And that's uh, not true for everybody. And that's okay. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it doesn't ruin your eternity. No, it absolutely not. It doesn't not. ruin your future. You've got, <laughs> there is a lot of people out here who will help. Though Scientology might think they're SPs because they left, how could that be suppressive, leaving an environment that it was? Yeah. It, it can, it's not. No, it's not. And we're, not. we're out here working to help people. Yes, exactly. We're, we're helping people who are where we were to get out and start new lives because right. the hope and joy and exhilaration of that is, is incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Freedom is a good thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Any last thoughts before we wrap up for this no, episode? I, I think we've covered it. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this getting released and seeing what we can achieve and do greater things. Yes, very definitely. Thank you so much, Janice, as always. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for joining me today. And thank you, Claire. You do a lot. I appreciate it. We yeah. all do. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.